your name and your role? Yes, I'm Professor Ian Rotherham. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor at Sheffield Hallam University in the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. Uh, and I am very interested in and reasonably knowledgeable about urban trees. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And thanks for coming and having the conversation with us. I really do appreciate it. Um, I think you know this, but we are broadcasting this and recording it, and it will be made available to anyone who wants to watch it afterwards, just to yeah. make sure you're aware of it. No, that's this. fine. That's fine. Um, uh, you'll also be aware that the dispute um, was a time of significant stress and emotional um, kind of content for lots of people, um, including lots of people in the city. And um, the process we're running here is one where we need to make sure that we're not defaming anybody or libeling anybody or putting into the public domain personal information which breaches anybody's data protection um, entitlements. If, which I'm not expecting, but if at any point mm -hmm. I'm worried that we're veering into that territory, I will tell you and, and um, ask you to adjust what you're saying. If I have worries after that, then in extremis I may have to pause the hearing and just say that you're yeah. um, aware of that's in the situation. Now. I'm not sure, I'm sure we won't be in that position. I hope we won't be in that position, I'll just say that. Um, and I'm, you know, we're, we're having very constructive, cordial, open discussions here. I think you've seen the terms of reference to the inquiry, you know what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. As with other people coming for these discussions with me, I've sent you a list of topics we're keen to discuss in a minute. We'll start to work our way through those. But maybe first I could give you a chance to say anything you'd like to say by way of introductory remarks. Yes, well first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Very much appreciated. I am a Sheffielder, uh, I'm very proud of Sheffield, I grew up here, um, and I grew up in Sheffield during really the end of the worst part of the gross pollution, pollution and degradation that we had. So I've seen the city environmentally at its worst, um, and I'm very passionate about the way that we've improved the city in many, many ways, and we have a reputation for being the most green and wooded industrial city in Western Europe. So that's something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I was very fortunate in my career to have the opportunity to set up Sheffield City Council's Ecological Advisory Unit in the 1980s and to run that for about 10 years. And through that had the opportunity to help shape and develop very positive environmental policies, including for trees and street trees. But I was also witness to some of the problems and changes of a post-industrial big northern city with severe financial constraints, which have got far, far worse over the period. So I was very, very involved in that. I was very knowledgeable. And I also, um, through my role at the Ecology Unit, became very active and involved with many community groups across the city, which I think was very important when the, the street tree issue arose because people knew me and people knew they could contact me. And over many years I've worked very closely with local media, the local newspapers, the local radio um, to deal with environmental issues and also just interesting natural history type questions that the public may have. So it's a mixture, trying to engage people, inform people, etc. Um, and the other thing which I think I brought to the situation was that I edit the main international journal on urban trees and urban forests and work with the main professional organisations. So I like to think, although I'm not an arboric culturalist, I do know a lot about the issues. And I also knew who to talk to to get expert advice, which I think was quite helpful. At the end of it all, I feel a, a very profound sadness that it ever happened because I felt personally and professionally it was unnecessary and I think it was a colossal waste of money and resources for a city that has limited money and resources. Um, and we lost a lot of trees that should not have gone and every tree which went unnecessarily I think is something that you cannot replace. I have a particular interest, I have to say, in historic and ancient heritage trees and veteran trees as, and was very involved in setting up the Ancient Tree Forum nationally 
and work closely with all the agencies and NGOs like the Woodland Trust, the Wildlife Trust, Forestry Commission, etc. So that was the position that I came to this from, um, and I hope that we can achieve some degree of a healing process and also um, we and others can learn from what happened and avoid it happening again. Very good, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, could you tell us how you, how and when actually, you first became aware of the removal of street trees and what your initial concerns were? I became aware of the depth of the issues. I mean, I, I knew some of it from when I worked with the council because we always had problems with lack of resource for street tree management. And I'd been at a national meeting in London on street trees in, I think it's 2010-11. And issues had been raised there about what was happening, particularly, I think, with the, the depth of cuts happening after the economic downturn, which was just turning a bad situation much, much worse. And I became aware of the situation in Sheffield round about, I would say, 2012-13. And how, how did you become aware of that? Really because of my role with local community groups and with individuals and through the local media, people started contacting me to say they were frightened, they were upset, they were feeling threatened, they were feeling isolated, and who could they talk to, where could they get information. And the situation previously, been, although we had limited resources in the council, you could phone one telephone number ask for someone and you would get someone who knew what was happening and they found they couldn't navigate to any system to get any information and they just got a notice on the tree saying trees were due to be felled and they maybe had a note through the letterbox saying this was happening and I felt that was that was just totally unacceptable um, so we started a process of people contacting the media and the media were contacting me from about that day okay you mentioned earlier that you had, I think you said for about 10 years, been the head of ecology service at the Chef City right, Council. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder whether um, there's any aspects of your work in that role that you think had a bearing on the street tree dispute, noting that, mm -hmm. in fact, you left the, the role quite a long yeah, time yeah, before yeah. The, um, the streets ahead contract. I think, agreed. yes, because in that role, I've, I always felt very that community engagement was very important. And in the 1980s, we had grown and supported something like 40 or 50 local environmental community groups, which was just amazing. Sheffield has got a reputation as being a series of small villages rather than a city. Um, and that those communities can be quite insular, have te terribly passionate and active in their patch, but they don't look over the hill to the next valley, they don't. So that was, that was quite important and I, I knew these people and I could also, what we tried to do in the 80s was actually network between different groups. So we introduced one group to another and then had workshops and things to grow their skills and their confidence. Um, and then also because people knew that I worked with the media, they would contact the media uh, and that was important. And then by work, through working in the city council I was involved and engaged in developing new environmental policies for woodlands, trees, nature conservation, countryside management, etc. And we had a very active, high profile countryside management service as well. So all that put me in a position to really know in depth the policy and strategy commitments that the council had made to the community of Sheffield. And I felt very passionately that unless you actually specifically overturn those commitments, they are still commitments and they should be upheld. Okay. Um, I, so I wanted to ask you about um, your observations on the early activity under the Streets Ahead contract and how this led to opposition developing to the programme. Uh, in particular, uh, any engagement you had with the removal of the oak tree uh, on Melbourne Road in Stocksbridge. Yes, this was one of the examples that raised awareness of what was happening. Stocksbridge has always been somewhat separate from the core of Sheffield. It's a separate township and it is physically and geographically removed. So very often people are not that closely aware of what's happening and it became very clear from 
correspondence I was getting from people I um, was in touch with through my newspaper contacts that something not very good was happening there. Um, and that particular oak tree, we found out later, was probably about 450 years old. Sheffield is very rich in trees. It's very rich in ancient coppice trees because of the industrial managed woodlands. It is very poor in what we call maiden trees, which are standard big old trees like 400 year old oak trees. Right. We have a handful. Right. Right. Because they're not part of a traditional industrial woodland management landscape. And some of these trees were in the wider countryside and then became urbanised as the city sprawled out into the suburbs. Right. So some of these trees actually go back before Sheffield. They are irreplaceable, though there's a genetic type from that location. They've not been planted. They have simply be become part of the urban catchment. Um, and that tree was one of them. And it had a degree of hollowing, which through my work with the Arboricultural Association, we knew from pioneering work on tree risk and tree failure that actually a hollow oak is stronger than a solid oak. Right. It's the uh, paper towel holder, it's the, the toilet roll holder principle. Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. get more strength in a yes. tube. Yes. So actually, unless the hollowing is very, very unevenly placed, those trees are sound. And it's, it's, it's has survived during storm events quite recently. There's no problem with it at all. And yet, despite local objections, it was being cut down. And one thing which came out of that was that there was a profound unawareness, or lack of awareness, of what we would call historical heritage trees, which is what that would be. And there were a number around the city, and some of these became um, passionately developed, by, uh, protected by the, the campaign that came about. But talking to senior people in Amy and talking to the leading councillors at the time, when we said, well, what are your policies, what are your strategies? and procedures on heritage trees, we just got a blank expression. They had no idea what we were talking about. And then with this tree in particular, I said, well, what, you know, how about the tree at Stocksbury? And I explained what that tree was. And they go, oh, oh, okay, well, we'll plant you another one. And I said, well, you can't. It's gone. You can't plant it. It's this unique genotype, etc., etc. And also, where are you going to plant it? Oh, it won't be in the same, we can't plant it in the same place. It'll be about half a mile away in the green space. And I said, well, if you go into the woodland nearby, you'll actually find there's tens of thousands of young oaks growing by themselves. So planting one tree does not replace that ancient tree. The late great Oliver Rackham said something like, one 500-year-old oak is worth 500, 5,000-year 5, 5, 5, year old oaks. Mm -hmm. You can't replace it. And then eventually it kind of seems to become apparent that they, they finally understood what we were saying about heritage trees. And they said, oh, well, what we'll do, we'll get you a blue plaque to put there, to say, here, there once stood a great oak tree. <laughs> and it was really that, that sort of level of lack of awareness, lack of understanding that the, the local people were passionate, the local people were now distressed, and the tree was irreplaceable. And this was a scenario that would play itself out again over the next nearly 10 years. Yeah, okay. So, I wonder if you could describe to us your perspective on how, following those initial events, and bearing in mind there were, as you said earlier, lots and lots of local groups, um, mm. how um, things then evolved with the formation of more groups and the development of mm. the campaign, and. Just give us your observations on how that panned out. Well, the first thing that happened when I was being contacted and when these things were starting to appear in the media as well, because at that point that level of protest, that level of anxiety was quite surprising to the media, so the media were, were covering it. The first thing I did was contact Amy, try to contact the council, but ended up contacting Amy as the agent for the council and had a meeting where I raised the issues and said, Let's sit down and talk. I think there's a, a crisis looming, but I think we can actually head it off at the past. I think the things you can do... St urban street trees are always problematic because they can bring about problems and they can need remedi remedial action. And that is often something that the public are not fully aware of. They don't understand the technical detail. 
So you have to go beyond what's normal to actually talk to people, explain to people, get them on side, get them to understand, when you actually have to do something drastic. In many cases you can take action that isn't so drastic. So I said, well look, let's have a look at this and let's see how we, you, we can engage people, how you can inform people. When something bad is going to happen on your doorstep, you want to know. Let's have a dedicated telephone line and things like that. Let's actually get some information out to people to say what we think is happening. And when, in the very unfortunate circumstances, with great reluctance, we have to lose one of these trees, explain why. If people see you going through the right process, if people trust your professional judgment, they will back you, almost 99%. So we had a very pleasant meeting, lots of ideas, and I said, I'm prepared to come out with you on your... They had a, an information bus that went out to different districts and basically told people what was going to happen. It didn't engage people in the process. I said, consultation is a two-way process. At this stage, you should be listening to people, telling them what your concerns are, listening to them, and I will be prepared to come out with you and do that. No, we're not interested. In, we're not interested in the dedicated line. They have to use the generic outline, um, we're not interested in the other ideas that you've got, and really we don't think there's a problem. And the councillor in charge basically said at early meetings, well, more people hate trees than like them. I get post by people saying they want trees removed, I get nothing from people saying they like trees. And I said, well, that's because you don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, right, to the council and say how much I value the tree outside my house. You might if you have a, a problem uh, that, that you feel the tree is causing, but you don't just spontaneously think, I'm going to write and tell them what a wonderful resource the street trees are. So I said, that's just crazy. You need to think about this. But they, they really weren't interested at that point. So do you remember when those discussions with Amy and the council were? That was around about 2013, 2012, 13. Okay. So it's quite early. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to say about those first meetings, um, including, you know, when and where meetings took place, who arranged them, the kind of issues discussed, who was involved? Yeah, I mean, what then happened was that we realised that having made overtures to raise the issue that we felt was a serious problem, but that at that stage the problem could be averted that what we did was to talk to some of the community groups and one of the things that I have done for many many years in Sheffield was to organise conferences and seminars and workshops nationally, internationally and regionally and locally. So we so said what we will do is bring together some of the key people from the emerging community groups and we will bring in some um, experts from the region and from around the country to speak to those groups about street tree issues in general but Sheffield in particular. So we organised a number of meetings, I think we call them Action for Woods and Trees and we had leading people um, on urban trees, on heritage trees, on urban tree environments. Uh, people like Alan Simpson from Leeds Beckett, who's an authority on the impact of trees on urban climates. Um, Jeremy Barrow, uh, an urban arboriculturist. We talked to other people like uh, Mark Johnson, who wrote the Trees in Towns report. And we had people like Ted Green and Joe Butler come and talk, uh, and Luke Steer, and a whole host of people to engage with the local community. And at those meetings, representatives of the council and Amy were invited and often attended. Okay, and when were those conferences? Do you remember? They were in... The first smaller meetings were held in 2013 and 14, and then the main workshops were in May 2015, October 2016. And then we had evening events at my university in November 2016. And I think we had another daytime meeting. I organised one. We had one which organised by our environmental students group at the university and asked me and various other people to speak. And we invited Professor Chris Baines, for example, again, a national authority and a government advisor. So if I've understood you correctly, you were organising meetings in 2014, 2015 
which people from the council and Amy were coming to, yeah. where all the concerns were being aired and expressed. Yeah. Yes, have I understood yeah. that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. The very first meeting was held at the St Mary's Church Community Centre near Bramwell Lane, and I think that was probably in 2013, okay. which was an evening meeting held with the Green Party and some of the local action groups. Okay, thank you. Um, you touched on the fact that, because you have a lot of expertise, the media were often interested in your views. Could yeah. you just tell us a little bit more about the scale of media reporting and interest and um, in the early stages of the of the dispute if you like and the kinds of things you were saying to the media yeah I mean the first things that were happening was that the, the media were picking up the concern and of course for the print media and I suppose for television as well um, street tree felling is a visual impact as well so that starts to become very, very newsworthy. And what was happening was quite shocking. So people were aware of it, the media were interested, they wanted to know. And I all the time tried to maintain a balance because on the one hand, in my career, I am an environmental advocate, but also I'm a professional. So my role, I felt, was to try and inform to give explanations to what the causes were, what the problems were, what the solutions might be, but often to do so quietly behind the scenes so that reporters and others knew what the issues were. And if, for example, you were on Radio Sheffield, the BBC are very careful about balance. So you couldn't be on Radio Sheffield or you couldn't have an advocate on Radio Sheffield without somebody from the City Council or the Amy side. If that wasn't the case, then the, the piece just got pulled. So it was actually trying to steer a line to actually get a balanced viewpoint and really to say, look, you know, that there are solutions here. We need to head this off. We need to stop it happening because what's starting to happen is, is unacceptable. And of course, with the enhanced media coverage and talking to local groups, that, that started to get people networking, get people talking, and it then generated actual campaigns. So rather than individual groups saying, whoa, what's happening? People are starting to take a much more focused, strategic view on the issues and saying, as a city, this isn't acceptable. Um, and a, a critical point of that was, was the emergence of the Rustlings Road Action Group, um, where you actually said it was by no means the worst example of what was happening, but it was a very uh, informed, professional body of people who were vocal. And one, I mean, at the end of it all, one of the things I was very concerned by was that some of the groups who were most badly affected, because the trees bring us all sorts of benefits, including when, particularly during COVID, we know about nature deprivation during lockdown and the health and well-being aspects of trees, all sorts of other benefits that you know, you know, the climate, the biodiversity, etc., etc. But the health and well-being issues, hugely, hugely important, but they are often far more important to communities who were the least able to vocalise and verbalise their views and who may not have even been aware of the impacts it was having on their health. And that, at the end of the campaign, that left me very sad that those people are often put to the margins, they're not engaged, there were attempts to do things like that. But in many of those poor parts of the city, the street trees are the green specs, they are the green infrastructure. Yeah. So that, that became an issue, but the campaign emerged and became far more coordinated and the media interest with the Rustling's Road uh, campaign really took off because it was starting, you could see with the media there's a certain period of interest and then it starts to slip and it's no longer newsworthy. And then of course we had the incident where two ladies were arrested in the early hours of the morning because they hadn't removed their cars and the media interest just went absolutely wild. Okay. It just took off from there. Okay, thank you very much for that. We might come back to some of that. But yeah. I, I, just to go back, I want to understand your perspective on how things evolved through 2014 and 2015. Um, and um, for example, what you, you saw of how campaigners 
tried to engage with the council, the response of the council and Amy to suggestions made in that sort of 2014-15 period. What do you remember of that? There were meetings that were held and there were attempts at, meet, at holding further meetings and generally I felt the campaigners raised valid thought out issues and they were mostly rebuffed. And unfortunately what then seemed to happen is the, the demands became more strident and the media interest became greater there seemed to be a campaign of misinformation by that who? made back from the city council and Amy to the media to the campaigners um, really giving very bland statements to try and just flatten any objection at all um, I, I remember what, one meeting, I, I wasn't present, there was a meeting at Sheffield University about something else where a council was present and one of the professors who was involved in the campaign was present at a different meeting and this council came up to the lady after and said well, I don't know why you're so worried about street trees, what do, what do they do for us? And she said well they photosynthesize, they mop up carbon, they produce oxygen and he said don't be so, so silly, where did he hear that? <laughs> he had no idea I had no idea of the basics that the trees were at the heart of our environmental equality. You know, it's just, and they were believing some of their own rhetoric. You know, they were saying that they had to do this. They were giving misinformation about the state of the trees. And the problem is, if you repeat misinformation enough, then it becomes something that's believed. So this seemed to go on throughout a lot of the dispute where the information that was being given out, the reasons that were being given, the, the six reasons for removal, really were a nonsense. And they didn't link into national policy, they didn't link into national practice or strategy. And I felt my role was quite useful then, because I, as I say, I was trying to keep behind the scenes, but I was able to network the emerging groups and campaign to national experts who either came to the city or looked at the policies, looked at the strategies, and were able to give genuinely impartial statements and views with authority. So I felt that was really, really important. And they just profoundly disagreed with what the council was doing. Mm. You, you, you maybe have touched on this by your reference to what happened in Nottingham's Road, but what do you think were among the key events as the campaign against the street tree removal and replacement gained kind of momentum? I think the, the Rustings Road one was really a tipping point because that had been a um, what Matthew and I described in some of our writings a lightning rod for, for bigger areas of discontent. The, the um, cabinet system of local government was one of the issues that was behind a lot of the problems and the removal of the local democratic process. So that became a lightning rod for that. But then the arrest of the uh, campaigners was hugely important. And from that we started to get other uh, action groups setting up. So Mearsbrook Park, for example, very, very vocal local people, absolutely impassioned about their trees. Um, and that came to but almost violent confrontation where they were being harassed by uh, security people and even by the police. Um, in Totley we had campaigners who were wonderful writers and poets who stood by their trees reading poetry to the arboriculturists who couldn't actually fell the trees because the campaigners were there. Um, and a whole series of events like that and then the campaign started to move to coordinated big meetings in the city centre outside this building, for example. And there were crowds of 500 to 1,000 people coming to hear what was, what was happening. Which is on By this building, you mean outside the town outside hall? Outside the town hall and on the steps of the city hall. Absolutely amazing demonstration of uh, passion, of... Uh, anxiety, of upset, of distrust. And one of the things that I feel positive about at the end of it was I am ever so proud of the, the way that the public of Sheffield responded. 
you know, that they actually stood up. They, they had passion. They were prepared to say what they felt, what they thought, and they were prepared to do what they could, as far as they could, to change direction. And it took several years, obviously, to achieve that. Mm. I, I wonder if you could just um, summarise for us what, what you were concerned that the negative impacts in the short and long run of the tree replacement program would have been if it had been continued um, as planned through the whole period? I think the first thing relates to what we said right at the start. So I've been involved in helping draw up policies and our, what I suppose now would be a biodiversity or ecology policy, our nature conservation strategy, I actually relied on street trees to create green corridors, green links between other green areas. And to understand this, you really have to think of the environment as a three-dimensional component. And the street trees aren't just the area, but they're actually the sheer volume, and they connect the other spaces. Um, and that was fundamental to our vision in the 1980s, 1990s, of where we would take the city in the future. We would strengthen these corridors, we would enhance the green spaces and we would reconnect them. This was before we knew about flood risk and climate change and urban heat islands and all the rest of it. So these were hugely important issues and what was happening was threatening that. It was actually discoordinated, uncoordinated, it had no reference to existing policies, which is what I'd asked Amy at the outset, you know, are you aware of this, this and this policy and said, no, we just signed the document, we didn't check any of this. I said, well, these are commitments. This is our long-term vision. How does what you're doing fit with a long-term vision? So if the campaign had gone on, if the, if the impact had gone on, that would have been seriously compromised. It was damaged, but it would have been far more seriously compromised, I think. And you lose all those benefits of biodiversity, of climate resilience, of flood resilience, of health and well-being for local people, uh, house values, all sorts of things are adversely affected by the damage that was being done. And then the other thing at the core of this was the deep, deep distrust between local communities and the authority who should represent those communities. And you know we have to accept that some communities were actually in favour of tree removal and they were vociferously so. So we then had communities where there was serious antagonism between those two communities, for the trees and against the trees. And my view was that the role of a local authority and the, local, the role of elected members is to heal those wounds and bring people together and seek common ground. Whereas what was happening was they were actually appearing to encourage one against the other, which to me was totally, totally unacceptable. Okay. In the light of what you've said over the last two or three minutes, there's a question that um, has sort of come to me, which I want to ask you, which is, why do you think it was, if all of these policies had been in place, and you recall them from your quite extended tenure as the head of the ecological service, do you have a hypothesis or a theory about why they were not adequately attended to or paid attention to during the period in which the Streets Head programme was developed? If I have my pessimist at all, when you come into this as a professional, as a young professional, you feel what you have to do is develop a strategy, develop a policy, get it accepted, win hearts and minds. And that was great. And I remember we signed off the Nature Conservation Strategy, which if I wrote it today would be far strongly, far more strongly worded. But we felt at the time it, it received lots of plaudits, and it's very good. And I remember talking to my planning colleagues who co-wrote it, and they said, great, that's job well done. I said, look, the job has only just started. You've got a policy, you've now got to implement it. And having observed, because part of my research at my university is what we call action research, observing and working with groups over time. So I had this unique timeline of insight. And one of the problems is that you get the policy accepted, everybody is supported, we consulted the public, we had like 10,000 responses before the internet. Members were on board, councillors, uh, officers, MPs, everyone was supportive. 
and we had a series of policies on woodlands, on countryside, on ecology, etc. If you then track that over the period, people move away, people pass away, people retire. And after 10 years, the memory gets less. After 20 years, the memory is largely gone. And even the, the senior officers, what happened with the cuts in local government services imposed by the national government was that lots of senior officers left. And if they were replaced at all, they were replaced by more junior, less experienced officers. And very often you don't get a hand on of knowledge, of policy, commitment, etc. And the same happens in some of the local groups who are involved in problems with policies and the elected members who are involved. So you end up with policies, but nobody even recalls that they were there. You don't need to overturn them, you simply ignore them. That's just a theory. Okay, but if I have understood you correctly, what you're saying is that, and I'm asking you to confirm whether I've understood you correctly, what you're saying is there was an erosion of knowledge and expertise, and there was also an erosion of institutional memory. Yeah, yeah. And the shift to a, a cabinet system from a committee system of local government, the committee system is incredibly bureaucratic potentially, and I have sat through very long meetings and can testify to that. But what it ensured was that every elected member served on a number of committees that dealt with these issues, often grassroots issues. So every local community had their local representation and those committees were nested in other committees and everybody had the ability to influence. So it was a hugely democratic process. That was removed down to a situation where one cabinet person, um, the councillor involved in this process, for example, held a portfolio for street trees and the environment, and his view of democracy was, well, he was elected, it passed over his desk, he approved it. That was the process. So all the rest of it simply goes out of the window. There's no process. And it was very, very strange, because not just street trees, but there were other tree issues happening at the time, where we asked for information on things like budgets, because I, I also do economic development, so I was interested in the economics of this. Um, and we couldn't get any information on what a piece of landscape was costing to manage before an event and after a particular intervention where trees had been removed. So we talked to councillors and they couldn't get the information. From their own council officers they couldn't get the information and what it turned out was that once you have a public-private partnership the information becomes commercially sensitive and confidential. So even though we were paying for what was happening there was no democratic right to have that basic information which we thought we had because of all the legislation on access to information etc. Which to me was absolutely outrageous. And even the councillors, beyond the inner clique of the cabinet, couldn't get information. Okay. Um, I wondered if there was anything else you wanted to say about your observation of, um, well, firstly, how you engaged with the campaign and were involved in providing advice or whatever you were doing to support the, those who were opposed to the removal of street trees. Um, and your observation of that period when the dispute was at its height, so I'm thinking between late 2016 and early 2018. Well, as I say, I tended to try to keep a professional distance so that I could act as, a, I suppose, a scientific advisor, uh, a professional advisor behind the scenes, and was still trying to talk to people in the City Council and Amy at the same time. I help to facilitate meetings because that's what I do professionally uh, and I was prepared to come and talk and speak at public events. I felt that was appropriate and I was very careful to try and not misuse my professional standing and professional status. So I was always very aware of that um, potential dilemma. And I talked to the media nationally or locally particularly but then nationally and internationally and again try to give a balanced point of view um, and I spoke with figures from the popular media who came to Sheffield and I was help I tried to help in getting people to come along who would then raise the profile 
So we have people like Chris Packham come to Sheffield, Jonathan Porridge who had set up all sorts of international environmental organisations. And if you actually have them talking and blogging about these things, then suddenly it goes absolutely international. You know, you're suddenly getting coverage all over the place. So that was, I felt that was a very important role, and to sometimes quietly talk to the media and say, well, these are the issues, these are the questions, these are potentially the solutions. Um, and I tried to advise the campaigners, because you know, there were more than one set of people involved in the campaigns, from very local to city-wide. Uh, so I tried to help and support and advise them where I could and to encourage them. And we organised the networking meetings. And then the other thing was that I was approached by quite a number of organisations and communities and local authorities around the country. So Sheffield was the one that got the publicity, but many other cities were also involved in exactly the same dilemma and had entered into long-term, very big budget projects and suddenly found lots of problems ensuing. And I went and gave advice to local authorities. I went and spoke to their officers. Some of them took those contracts back in-house. And I went and talked and I talked to campaigns and campaigners around the country and even around the world. So that was kind of how I saw my role, um, trying to help where I could uh, behind, the, behind the scenes where possible. Right, OK. And I, I want to come back to some of the things you just said. But just to be clear for confirmation of what I think you said. So you weren't involved in protests on the street or directly campaigning. You were standing a bit further back and trying to provide sort of, yeah, sort of yeah. dispassionate perspective. Yeah. Um, okay, very good. And, and where things like the street tree protests were happening on the streets, like say at Mearsbrook or in Totley, what I was doing was that I was and more recently moved into doing social media, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and I would provide opportunity for people to comment and send photographs and to promote and to network through that. So I felt that was a role that I could do. I felt actually being on the front line on the street was inappropriate with my professional standing and would diminish my impact in other ways. Okay. Now, um, the next thing I wanted to ask you, you started to talk about um, just a moment ago, which is how what was going on in Sheffield was perceived elsewhere by interest groups, you mentioned the Woodland Trust and others, by other local authorities and more broadly, what was your, how did you see how other people were sort of observing what was happening here? They were shocked, both the professionals and other local authorities, including their professional officers, were absolutely astounded by, first of all, what was happening, but then also the public response. It made them draw breath and step back, I think. Um, around the world, it had a huge impact. I suddenly had people who were coming back from holidays, say, in North America, and they'd say, oh, well, now, where are you from? They'd be in a bird watching hide somewhere. And they say, well, where are you from? So I'm from Sheffield, gee, the place that hates trees. And I've been going around the world for years as an advocate for Green Sheffield. I'm a regional tourism ambassador. You know, I promote Sheffield in its good name. And it was having a hugely detrimental effect, which, of course, ultimately, potentially has a bad effect on the regional economy. You know, it affects the tourism economy. But it also affects people's perceptions. And we've worked ever so hard to promote Sheffield as a green city. So this was an awful thing to witness. Absolutely awful. Um, what it also did, I think, it did show groups that they could take action. They could be effective, though not always. Um, and there are still ongoing disputes, tree disputes with, say, Network Rail in Leeds. There's a long-run campaign there. And people found that they could actually do things. Um, I think also people, and it was, it was very upsetting in some ways, people then realise the negative effect it has on their own health and well-being through this and through their neighbourhood being adversely affected. So people start to become very, very aware of the issues. But I think it did have a big impact on the media, it had a big impact on communities through the media and it had an impact on what other cities were doing. And I think, I hope it made some cities step back and reevaluate what they were doing and think about 
the importance of working and taking your community with you when you do these things. You touched on other local authorities just then and, and earlier as well, and you said other local authorities had got plans to deal mm. with some of their trees in a way which would, you thought would be problematic. Are you aware of any local authority which has undertaken or tried to undertake a tree replacement programme on the scale that Sheffield was trying to do? Birmingham went part way down that route, as did I think Southampton and I think Newcastle. But a lot of cities then stepped back and started to look at best practice, the sort of Mark Johnson type approaches. And I certainly noticed when I went to meetings um, in Manchester, for example, they used different ways of actually allowing routes to come out for pavement. So there are the ways that you can engineer a solution. Um, I went to a meeting at Kew Gardens on urban trees and you go through Twickenham and there are huge trees, some are actually in the roadway, but there was no way that they were going to be removed because the people there recognised that this was central to their, their suburb, their community, their environment, who they were. So you could see that people were doing things differently. And one of the questions I'd asked Amy right at the outset was, well, you've got a tree replacement programme and you say you're replanting trees. Are you placing the trees you're replanting into properly constructed tree pits? Because a lot of the problem was that the trees were planted before people understood about how they might live pavement. And there is a way that you actually plant trees into pre-prepared tree pits and then the roots go underground and there's no problem. And the answer was, no, we haven't got the money. So I said, so in a hundred years' time, you'll be in the same position where you will be saying, your, your followers will be saying, these trees are no longer fit for purpose, they're left in the pavement, because you've done it wrongly now. If you're going to do this, and that's the logic, you need to do it properly. And if, you, if you're not doing that, the other thing is to look at best practice, which is one of the things that we brought in experts to look at, um, and you need to think about other engineering solutions. So other things like flexible tarmac, you can actually lift paving stones and go over and around the roads. And this is being done. You can prune the roots. There are ways that you can do this. This is best practice and it's standard. And some of the London boroughs were already doing this. Mm -hmm. And we just were faced with, no, we don't do that. The, the classic one, of course, was the, the Nether Edge Huntingdon Elm, which is a disease-resistant elm. And that was one of the other things that really became, of course, so that um, and triggered interest because the community there were brilliant. They, they'd hired a double-decker bus so that children could go on top of the double-decker bus at the public event and see the white letter Hare Street butterflies <laughs> breeding in this elm um, tree. Um, and that was hugely, hugely motivational and it, it was the commitment and the imagination that really grasped people's um, thought processes. But the council and Amy were saying that tree will cost us something like 60 to 70 thousand pounds to remediate. The group got a professional highways engineer to look at it and he said about three or five thousand pounds maximum to redo the pavement. And this was the problem that we were up against. Um, but as I say, I think it was, it was very helpful being able to network with others around the country to be able to bring in experts and to share that. Um, that expertise. Okay. Um, just to bring you back to the question I asked about what you saw in other local authorities, again, I want to check whether I've understood you correctly or not. I think what you said was some other local authorities may have contemplated doing something hmm. of a similar scale to what yeah. was planned to happen here. But in fact, nobody that you're aware of did that, and one of the reasons was because they engaged in a different way with their local stakeholders. I, I, mm. is, that, is that what I you said, think, or have you said something slightly different? I think some of the authorities like Birmingham went part way down that route, and I think they stopped. I would have to check that, but I think they didn't progress as quickly or as far as Sheffield. Right. Um, but I would need to check whether that was the case. Certainly a lot of them seemed to stop and take pause and I had contacts with some of them for advice. Okay. 
Um, are you aware of any other place where there's been such a cause celebre as um, has evolved in Sheffield around this? Not in the same, not to the same extent. Um, and part of that is probably the way the media operates in that the second time is never going to be as big as the first mm -hmm. example. And I think also people started to learn that this was not a good road <laughs> to go down. I so I think that's it. there were certainly there were campaigns. And in fact, after the Sheffield campaign, I was involved in advising Doncaster, now, now Doncaster City, um, in issues that some of their street trees had had. Uh, and they'd had trees which were causing some serious problems and they'd removed some and there'd been a very, very vociferous campaign about it. And the council asked myself and the so to go in and, and mediate. And that was quite successful. And I think it, it reduced the scale of action that was going to happen. And they looked at other alternative ways of, of dealing with it. Okay. Um, what about the... Um, views of people in the narrower arboricultural and the environmental sector, um, both in Sheffield actually, but outside Sheffield. What did you hear from other people about what they were observing? It was very difficult. I mean, I go to national meetings, international meetings of arboriculturalists. I go to the meetings of the Ancient Tree Forum and was asked to stand up and speak at some of those meetings about what was happening and of course the industry is populated by people who are passionate about trees but of course as an arboriculturalist you're a professional and you make your living out of tree work so you then have a situation where people are being vilified in the media and amongst local communities for actually going about their daily work and some of the, these people are people I know very well and are on very good terms with some live in Sheffield, some were from outside. Some were passionately believing that what they were doing was correct. Some would not do it because they said it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And some people actually started work on projects and then said, I'm walking away from this, I will not do any more because I think it's wrong. Um, so there was a, a bit of a schism within the industry. Uh, and it does raise not just for the arboriculture industry, but with similar sort of situations and developments elsewhere, it raises issues of ethics for consultants, ecologists, arboriculturists, and other environmental professionals. Because on the one hand, you sign up to do your best for the environment and the local community, but then you may be being paid to do things that you actually know and believe may be damaging. So that does become really quite a difficult situation. And at one point in Sheffield, they were basically having to bring in consultancies from outside the city because some of the local ones had just said, we're not doing it anymore. Okay. Um, I want to ask you whether you have a view about the contextual factors, if you like, in the council and in Sheffield more widely um, that you think may have led to the dispute and caused it to unfold in the way that it, it did? I fully accept that my views on this are slightly biased because I have a view about public service, which I think is hugely, hugely important. And I think to get good public service, you actually have to invest in public service. And I realise that may not be what everybody wishes to hear. Um, but I think the, the twin elements of the cabinet, the adoption of the cabinet system, which is inherently undemocratic and controls authority in a few individuals, who may not have the expertise or experience to carry out those roles effectively, and may not realise that they should take good advice. And I think that is twinned with really deep cuts to local authority services in things like the environment and countryside and trees and particularly to street trees. Street trees have always been the Cinderella of the tree world in the urban areas. Woodlands always have friends groups and if you go 
near a woodland with a chainsaw, then people will turn out very quickly. The street trees, as I wrote about in 2011, often have no friends. Obviously we found in Sheffield they did, they were just in hiding. Um, but the cuts to local authority services meant that you lost expertise, you lost continuity, and I think particularly meant that you lost the senior staff who had knowledge and had the ear of the leading councillors and of local MPs. So you actually lost key people. The people who were left were good professionals, but they were under constant threat that they could lose their jobs almost at any moment. This was the feeling that we got. The cuts that happened from the 1990s right the th way through the economic downturn and beyond. This was a really stark time. So you've lost those key people who would have advised the councillors and their advice would have been don't sign it, don't do it. The street trees were tagged on to the highways project which was a whole separate issue um, and also it's a separate kind of worms. But if we concentrate on the trees, they were almost an afterthought. This is how it was described to me by people in Amy that signed the document. Um, so due diligence hadn't been done, councillors hadn't taken advice and I know from friends and colleagues inside the City Council as officers that advice had been given on the interim documents, they basically read penned them and that advice was totally ignored because those officers were not at the level where they could go to a senior member and say look this is a problem this needs to be thought through more carefully. Don't sign it. So just tell me a little bit more about that to the extent that you can, um, given that it's, you know, you, you, you don't want to, no. um, you know, put people in an unreasonable position. But just tell me a little bit more about, to the extent you can, about advice given by, as you've described it, junior officers which um, who implicitly as I said mm. spotted there could be a problem with the way the plan was being developed I suppose between 2006 and 2011 and whose advice was ignored red yeah. penned in yeah. the way you put it yeah I mean basically they would be afraid to give advice I was contacted by people actually within Amy to say that what I was saying because I've said I've made some public statements about challenging the economic reasons behind some of the street tree uh, issues and the practice that was being carried out. And I had contact from within Amy and I had to say to people, look, don't, please don't put this on my blog because you will be sacked. And I had other people contacting me from within Amy saying, we have been told that if you, um, if you contact him that you will lose his job. So there was advice inside the authority saying, you know, inside the business, the business partner, saying this isn't good practice. There was advice within the city council saying this isn't good practice. But you'd also move not only to a cabinet system, where in a committee system you've got a greater breadth of potential interest and expertise and experience across a broader area of the city. You know, you've got people representing communities and listening to communities and feeding in. That had just stopped. Um, but yeah. Sorry, just for a clarification, are you saying that's what happened after the contract was signed and Amy was in place, or are you also no, saying... No, that, that was happening before, that was happening in the build-up. This is, to a large extent, why the contract was signed in the way that it was, I think. I see. And there was also a move, as in many big organisations, to what I would describe as generic managers, rather than specialists. So in the past, the people who ran the city's recreation or park department or countryside planning section were people who had come through the professional process. They were passionate about their subject. They were authorities often in their subject. They had grown in the role and they really knew in detail what they were doing and they had the insight and the confidence to deliver that service. And what you started to see were generic managers who had no real empathy with the core issues, but simply managed process and budget and contracts. And that seemed to be where there was a problem. And in the contract itself, I just found it very, very peculiar. Peculiar probably isn't the word. I mean, to sign something like a £2.4 billion 
project without doing due diligence has to be reckless on both the part of the council and of the business partner. I just find that completely perplexing. Okay. Um, in 2018, the council, with in agreement with Amy, started adopting a different approach, as you know. Um, and I just um, wonder if you'd like to comment on what's different now, the other side of the dispute, and if, if there are any ongoing concerns you have that you want to tell us about, about the approach to managing street trees in Sheffield. Yeah, the, the peculiar thing was that one response from the depth of concern expressed by the community was the, the City Council and Amy set up almost like an expert panel that would view the trees. So if 20 trees were presented as requiring felling, they would go and inspect them. And then, and these were people, they were paid as professionals and they were, they were leading authorities in the field, they would go out and inspect the trees. And they might then say, well actually of those, 14 can be saved with removed action, maybe even more. And then Amy went ahead and fell them anyway. So when was that, that example you that was that? I can't remember the exact date, so that was probably, I would guess that was in the period from 2016 to 2018. Okay. So they had an expert panel, which they paid for, but then ignored, mm -hmm. which just undermined their credibility. This is the so-called independent treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, fine, that's helpful. I was actually asking about the period after, after that. Yeah. Um, April, March, April, May, I think then the chaired by the Sheffield Wildlife Trust, Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust, they set up a, a separate inquiry and panel and that started, I think, at last to heal the wounds and to bring together um, the disparate groups in a way that allowed people to actually reconsider and reconvene, basically. So the decision makers now seem to be listening and seem to be taking proper cognizance of the advice they were being given. And what was also coming out with some of the ideas about best practice were also coming through and people were looking at alternative ways of doing this and realizing that actually the vast number of trees that were down for felling should not happen. I mean one of the things to actually trigger that whole process I think was the, the felling of the war memorial trees as well, which was just such a, a crass misjudgment on the the anniversary of the song to then be thinking of felling the trees that were planted in commemoration of the fall and it's just so it was heartrending and it was so unthoughtful it was just appalling so I think all these things sort of brought people together and said look we, need, we do need to talk and at long last I think there was a way forward I am very happy I think from what I see of what's happening as a partnership for the street trees and I think there are lessons rolled out to other cities, other regions uh, in the same way. So I think that has been a, a good outcome di despite the, the cost in many, many levels. Um, we have a separate issue which is not street trees but is woodlands writ broad where there are huge numbers of trees being felled without public consultation yet again which actually surprises me because I was thinking the other day that one of the impacts of Sheffield was to change government policy and to insist that there is a public consultation if more than a certain number of trees are to be felled. And it does feel like that is still not happening away from street trees. That's a separate discussion. But that does still cause a lot of angst. Okay. There is, um, as I understand it, a woodland strategy in the city as well. Um, but you're saying things you're concerned about are happening notwithstanding that strategy. The woodland strategy as it is, well, you have a city like Sheffield which has 80 or more ancient woodlands and those woodlands have all the benefits we've talked about are all, but they're also amazing heritage landscapes with archaeology going back sometimes two, three, four, five thousand years um, and that is not featured in the woodland strategy as it is at the moment and the strategy is being overridden by emergency felling um, for various reasons, particularly linked to ideas of tree disease, which professionally I don't think are valid, and that is being challenged. I see. But it's not taken, it's not taken into account. 
And the problem with strategies is that they are only as good as the words they contain, and they're also only as good as the officers that are allowed to implement them. And we still have a situation where the local authority is short of key personnel in key areas. Okay. Okay. Um, are there other things you'd like to say about the impact the dispute had on Sheffield as a city and any ways in which the effects are still felt today? I think it had a huge impact on external perceptions of the city and Sheffield's good name. Sheffield became famous for the campaign, which is good in that it shows the, the character of the community. It was bad in that it was a terrible, terrible dispute that needn't have happened and caused huge damage and cost an awful lot of money. So I think that will take a long time to go away. I think the new initiative is a big step in that direction of actually saying Sheffield is a green place, it's a sensible place, it's a good place, it's a community friendly place, it's a biodiversity rich place. I think that is happening. It will take a long time for the memories to to go, I think. So that gives me a, a degree of pride and a degree of sadness. If I could turn back the clock, you know, one of the things I've said is the, the depth of uh, central government cuts to local authority services and if we could take the money that's been wasted on the street trees and invest it in core services for the community and the environment, that would make me a very happy person. Yeah, okay. You sort of touched on this a little bit by saying that the um, dispute had tarnished the reputation of the city and this will take a while before that can be recovered from. But are there other elements of the, if you like, the legacy of the dispute? In, I mean, for example, in terms of any possible impact on the way national policy has evolved or the way these issues are dealt with in academic circles which touch on arboriculture and environmental issues? I think Sheffield triggered a major change in government awareness and government policy. So that was, that was a really good thing and the Forest Commission came in and <coughs> did a review of the Sheffield situation and they backed the campaign absolutely, which again was a quite a radical position. So that was, I think that was a shock for councillors, but that was a great thing in terms of the national profile. Um, and for a short while the government had a tree champion to help bring people together and listen and take views forward. So I think all that has been very, very positive. I'm in part an environmental historian, so I deal with centuries and thousands of years. So a decade is, is a bat of the eye, and it will take decades to recover. It will take a long time to recover. But we need to do that. We need to move forward. We need to be positive. And I think other, other cities, other communities have learned, and I think, I think government has learned, and I think authorities around the world have learned. I've been contacted by media all over Europe and across the world, and people have learned from the experience. So it's, it's pain that we've gone through and in my view unnecessary pain, but I think it may have a good outcome ultimately, I hope. Okay. What needs to happen to ensure that such a dispute doesn't emerge again at some point in the future here in Sheffield? There is no guarantee. There is absolutely no guarantee because I say with policies, you can have a wonderful policy one year then ten years on people forget. The most powerful thing I think, and I would say this as an educator, is education, is growing champions. Now those champions are at every level, which is something I try to get across to people. It might be someone on your street who's a champion, the people that went out and hugged the trees, the people that climbed into trees, the people who were out in bitterly cold conditions to get there before the fencing went in so they were within the law to save their trees. They are champions. The MPs who stood up for it, they are champions. The councillors who stood up are champions. And the officers, very often it, it hinges on key officers experienced, appropriately remunerated and given the confidence and the responsibility to take these forwards. 
it's the champions that are the future. Everything else is vulnerable. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's been extremely illuminating and interesting and highly relevant to the issues I'm um, inquiring into. Is there anything else you'd like to say that you've not, we've not touched on so far? Not really. I'm, I'm just very pleased to have been invited, very grateful to have the chance to address you like this, and very grateful for you being here doing this work. I think it's hugely, hugely important. It is beyond Sheffield. It's not um, just Sheffield, it's beyond Sheffield, it's not just the UK, it is a global issue. Because we are an urban society, we are becoming more urban, these, these conflicts potentially will get greater. Um, you know, we're in a world where we're losing biodiversity, we're losing, we, we're having climate change, we're having, you know, here in Sheffield we have massive flooding issues. All these things are mounting up and the street trees are part of the solution and this meeting, I think, is hugely, hugely important in getting that message across to a very wide audience. So thank you for your efforts. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so Charles, I think we can turn off the...